Hello, I'm Neil. I'm a research analyst at King's Digital Lab. And over the last few years, I've been learning a fair bit about the various technologies that can be used to create 3D content. Digital 3D models are used in many ways, in film and entertainment and in video games, in advertising, in architecture and design and so on. And advances in home computing technology have made many of the techniques developed in the creative industries available to a far broader audience than just the industry specialists. If you have a latest generation iPad or iPhone, for example, you can scan objects directly with your device. Some of the most capable and versatile software in the world is completely free to use and runs on Windows, Mac and Linux systems. If you struggle to manipulate the 3D space on your 2D computer screen, you can now try modelling while using a VR headset. There are so many different ways to create 3D content. There's the blocky voxel style landscapes of Minecraft. You can sculpt by stretching and carving virtual clay into organic shapes. Or you can make cities by editing the properties of cubes and spheres and cylinders and other simple geometric primitives. These different techniques occupy their own niche in the big ecosystem of 3D modelling and I've been looking at different ways to use many of these technologies in our research at KDL. Creatively it's been a very rewarding journey for someone like me who used to spend a great deal of time coding but was always intrigued by the idea of new and imagined realities. For me the attraction of a medium like VR is the opportunity to create my own environments and atmospheres on a scale and ambition that was once the preserve of wealthy eccentrics like Sir Clough William Ellis when he created Port Merion or Sir John Soane's house in Lincoln's Inn Fields. For the rest of this video I'm going to look at a few methods of creation and more importantly talk about a few core concepts in 3D modelling that I hope will give anyone starting out a good head start in learning how to make their own content. One thing I'm not, however, is a videographer, so I hope you'll indulge me if the camera shakes a little from time to time, or the exposure fluctuates, or the sound is sometimes a bit choppy, and the edits and cuts are a little amateurish, but I may as well make a picture of it. So I'm here in my local graveyard in Brighton, and I'm here because these monuments around me make particularly good subjects for photogrammetry. Photogrammetry is one of the most accessible ways of creating 3D scans of objects and environments. And it's popular because as long as you have a camera and a computer, you can achieve some pretty good results. Photogrammetry models are created by taking photos from multiple vantage points of the subject using a computer to interpolate the surface. And I'll show you how in a minute. So this is a photogrammetry model hosted on the Sketchfab site, which I encourage you to have a look at for all the different amazing content you'll find there. This is a photogrammetry model of a cromlech which I walked past when I was on a holiday in North Wales and I just couldn't resist getting out my uh, just my mobile phone camera in this case in order to take uh, the, the photos I needed to create this model in the software that we will talk about very shortly. And you can see how appealing these models are straight away that we can really get inside the, the space, um, the fairly straightforward to create, beautifully textured, beautifully detailed. Software can take care of most of the complexity of the process, but we can arrange it so that conditions are as good as they can be for the photographic stage. So photogrammetry doesn't work so well if there are shiny or reflective surfaces on our subject matter. The process relies on us being able to identify the same features from one vantage point to the next. And those features need to be consistently identifiable by the software we use, which means high contrast and surface details are very useful. If you have strong sunlight, it can be problematic too. We want to avoid strong shadows that can change throughout the capture process. Or even worse, I could be casting my own shadow onto the subject as I take the pictures. So conditions where there is good but diffuse light are ideal. These gravestones have a rough surface texture and the lichen helps to give extra detail. So 
for a, a subject like this, which I can move freely around, I start by taking a circuit of pictures at a constant level of pitch, with pictures roughly overlapping by about 60%. So I'm going to make a, a traverse around the object, keeping my camera at the same pitch and level. And when I reach the start, I'll do it all over again from a different pitch and level. And if I wanted to capture a horizontal or vertical feature, like a wall decoration, like this wonderful door here, I'd take a slightly different approach. Take this. Uh, door and the texture on the side of the church. As before, I want to take images that are at least 60% overlapping, but in this instance, I keep my camera perpendicular to the surface I'm interested in, and I take side steps and raise the level of the camera in each pass. So, in a classic mess calculation, I've come out to the uh, graveyard with my fixed focus lens, which is a 50mm lens, but unfortunately, the 50mm doesn't allow me to get quite as far away enough as I need to be from these, uh, from these uh, monuments in order to get the whole thing in the frame. So, for our demonstration, I'm also going to take a set of photos of this rather humble grave behind me, using the same technique because I can fit the whole thing into frame. So when I've got a comprehensive set of pictures, we can start the processing stage. And it's worth noting here that for archival purposes, I'd be using raw images as well as a fixed focal length for all the images in the set. But for demonstration purposes, a good set of JPEGs will suffice. The big names in photogrammetry software are Agisoft, Metashape, Reality Capture, but there is an open source program called Meshroom which also gives excellent results. For this demonstration though, I'm going to use Metashape because it makes it very simple to describe the processing stages. So I've just had a look at that footage from the graveyard and for me and my um, lockdown beer belly, I've brought the camera back uh, here to my lab kitchen and I've transferred the photos over to my computer and we're going to use the, the, uh, the processing in Metashape very quickly. Now I've pre-processed this so that we can uh, don't have to sit around and, and wait for it all to happen but for reference it took about 15 minutes to process these uh, 33 photos. Um, so very quickly if we look at these photos um, you can see what I was talking about in terms of these uh, uh, increments around the subject. They're all slightly out of order, which means that the, uh, um, the, the sequence doesn't look quite perfect. Um, it doesn't matter too much in this case. Um, one of the great things about Metashape is that we can simply use this workflow menu up here and go through these four stages, align photos, build dense cloud, build mesh, build texture, and we'll talk a bit about what those things are soon. Of course, you can make it a lot more complicated than that, but why bother? Um, the point is that from this video, you know that there is something called photogrammetry. And once you know that, you can go away and use your choice of popular search engine to find out a little bit more about it and how to, and how to make a really good go of it. Um, so the first thing we do is align the photos. Um, in this instance, that took uh, maybe uh, maybe a minute or so, and if you have a look at these uh, blue panels, that those blue panels represent the vantage points um, that I was uh, that I, that I got each of those pictures from as I went around that small uh, gravestone in the local graveyard. And with a quick glance, I can confirm pretty much that this was that was the transect that I took around uh, the object. And if I turn off the cameras and zoom in a little bit, you can just see the start of the kind of shape 
of the gravestone um, being uh, shown by that what we call a sparse point cloud there. So once I've confirmed that I'm happy with those camera positions and that is indeed a correct calculation, if I go on to the next stage, I can build a dense cloud. Again, that took maybe two or three minutes for this small photo set, so I'm going to show you the dense cloud view. And instantly we've got something that looks very much like our, our, our subject, and I can rotate around that. And it's already quite a pleasing thing to look at. Um, you'll see also that uh, grass and those kind of um, textures with lots of particles on them are, are quite hard to capture. Um, it looks like a solid from here, but if I zoom in, you'll start to see that it's still actually a collection of very, uh, of very closely packed points. So the next thing we do is to build the mesh. And the software builds the mesh based on the, the, uh, the, these points and the relationship to each other. So if we look at the mesh, um, the mesh is essentially a, a collection of triangles which uh, describe the form that the, uh, the dense point cloud has, has shown. Um, so in some ways that looks like a step back in terms of quality because there's one more stage that we have to do and that is to build a texture. So this is going straight back to the source materials to these, um, to these images and using them to mosaic a, a, a photo texture onto our 3D object and this is our 3D object and you can see it looks pretty convincing um, there are a few flaws here a few strange facets um, but we've got a really nice texture there we can rotate around that object and of course I've made all kinds of decisions about how we process that data um, and those things need to be recorded in a research setting. We need to record the decisions we're making, the settings of all the equipment that we're using. Um, and that stuff will constitute the power data for this, uh, for this 3D model. Now, one of the things about photogrammetry as a process is that it's, uh, it's great for research purposes because it creates these very, um, very realistic, um, very true to form uh, shapes up to a certain point that they, 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 they are uh, they're, they're very representational of the, of the subject matter um, but they're also very dense so what I mean by that is if we go back to uh, a wireframe mode you can see now uh, quite how many uh, individual triangles there are um, which are making up that form um, in fact down here I found out we've got just short of uh, 60,000 of these faces are making up this form. Okay, we could lose a few because we're not really interested in the grass. Um, but the issue here is that these, uh, th this very dense shape makes a large file size. It means that if you were to put this 3D object into something like a game engine or a, or a headset, um, and you started putting a few of these assets together, very quickly you would find that the hardware started to struggle um, depending on the on, on the hardware that is and so this is one particular method particularly useful for archiving a lot of museums have um, have, have built quite extensive collections of photogrammetry models um, of items in, in their collections um, but if we wanted to use an asset in a more a gamified or entertainment setting, we might choose to create 3D content through another method. So let's have a look at one of those. Hello again, another day, another t-shirt, the same hat. Um, if you need to create 3D assets from a design or in a kind of free flow way from your imagination, the likelihood is that you'd want to use one of several programs that allow you to create and manipulate geometric primitives uh, into more complex forms. The big names in this space are things like 3ds Max, Maya, and there are many others, but the software that I'm most familiar with is Blender, which is free and open source. Blender's been around for 
good long while, with a development supported by a really rich community of creators and contributors. And when it released version 2.8 last year, it was widely held that it entered a new phase of its maturity, which really cemented its importance in the 3D ecosystem. Now, these applications all tend to have very similar interfaces, which can be extremely intimidating for the beginner, as they grapple not only with new software, new concepts, but also just the challenge of manipulating a 3D shape in a 2D environment. But anyone will recall from their high school maths lessons the general components of shapes and geometries, such as uh, vertices, lines and faces. And through a combination of moving these components, adding new geometry, and using extrusion and subdivision, that provides an incredible versatility uh, to working in this way. So I'm going to open Blender and look at a file that I've been working on recently. Now this is a piece of work that's come about because of a project I'm doing with the artist Jane Wildgoose, who is curates the, the Wildgoose Memorial Library. In Jane's collection, there are things which have a, a troubling provenance, shall we say. There are things like human skulls, there are objects made of ivory, there are objects made from the remains of endangered animals. And as part of this kind of reflection of the nature of collecting, um, which is the essence of this project, we're recreating some of those objects in 3D, digital 3D, um, and we hope to place them in a virtual safe room. Now, one of the ideas we are playing with is that there are these uh, ivory polyhedrons. Jane has some. There's some excellent examples in the Green Vault in Dresden. And we were, I used Blender, for example, to create this shape and also to create these animations um, to play with the idea that this kind of complex geometry might be an interesting space to think of as a safe room for some of these some of these troubling items. And you'll see I was able to give it a kind of nice ivory texture. Um, but if we look into the geometry you'll see that it's just made out of simple um, faces and lines and, and vertices, vertices and if I move around those vertices or lines I can really make a mess of things. Um, I can do something called extrusion on a face and I can extrude that face out and perpendicular to its origin. But I don't want to save that. So let's just see how we go about making these kinds of shapes. Um, let's do something really, really simple just so you can see how these simple geometries can become something more interesting. So I'm just going to add a cube to the default Blender space and uh, it should be pretty obvious what I'm going to make. I'm going to uh, squash this down in the z-axis, this cube. At the moment there are only six sides to this cube but I'm going to put a couple of subdivisions in and scale those out on the y-axis and I'm going to put a couple of subdivisions in and scale those out on the x-axis and now I've got my space nicely divided underneath I'm going to extrude those areas there down in the z-axis and I'll take these three faces at the back of my object and I'll extrude those up in the z-axis and I'm going to put another subdivision there move it slightly and I'll get rid of these faces and that's left me with a funny gap so I'll just grab those edges around there and I'll do something to connect that so we still have a kind of watertight shape. Um, you can see I'm going to make a chair. I'm just going to extrude the seat a little bit and add a little bit of a bevel to the edge of it so that it looks more like a, a cushioned surface rather than a very uncomfortable chair. Give me adjust the profile there, but I won't spend much time on this at all. It's just a very quick demonstration. Um, let's do that at the top of the chair as well because it looks a bit stiff at the moment. So if we put maybe a nine subdivisions in there, and I'm just going to grab the middle subdivision, 
I'm going to turn on something called uh, uh, relative movement, um, and I'm just going to move that back of that chair out so it's bowed a little bit more naturally. And let's just add a little bit of extra length on the tops of those the chair there. Proportional movement, that was the <laughs> expression I was looking for. Let's add another uh, subdivision there and we can add, uh, oh, turn off proportional movement now. Um, and let's add a little bit of the cushion back to our chair as well. We'll just select those faces as we did before. Extrude them slightly. Add another little bevel to the edges around the edge. Good. And uh, you can get very lost in this, these processes and spend many hours trying to uh, perfect something, but we're really are trying to make something very quick and easy here. So let's just select all the faces that make up these cushions, both on the, the back of the chair and also down on the seat of the chair. We'll move that one in as well. Edges, grab the seat. Oop. And I'm now going to just do something that will separate those into a different object so I can very easily give them some different uh, colours. Uh, I'll just pick something simple here, I'll give them a simple material. Um, let's turn on the rendering. Um, add a simple material, which I'll just drag up to here. I'm just going to make them red. Uh, I'm going to make sure they're less reflective. So turn down the roughness a little bit there. Still a bit bright, but we're in a hurry, so let's not worry about it too much. Um, what about the rest of the chair? We don't want a plain color. I've got some textures preloaded in this version of Blender, actually, so I can just go and grab a, a wooden texture from this list. Let's find one that might look nice on the chair. Um, maybe this one. That one looks good. Let's add that. Okay, so now we've got our chair started to take shape. Remember, we just started from a cube a few seconds ago. Um, just going to put a little bevel on the edges to make it look a bit more natural. But we haven't turned on rendering properly yet, so we're still in a kind of modeling view. Oh, grab everything. I'm going to move it up so that it's on the, uh, on the floor plane. And I'm actually going to add a floor plane in, so we'll just add another simple geometry, which is a square. Stretch it out. Now our chair is sitting on a square, on a plane. Let's give that some uh, concrete texture as well. Any of these will do. At the moment, while the computer works it out, and okay, so you can see these very crude textures. Um, that's kind of just indicative of how it would look. Let's turn on some better shading and some better lighting. In fact, we'll switch to render engine. And after a few seconds calculation, we should have a much better representation of how that chair looks. Okay. Back and forth and back in cycles. Okay. Updated my graphics card, so it was taking a little while. I'm also going to turn on some natural lighting. I've got an add-on here which uh, simulates environmental lighting, so I'll turn that on as well using its default settings. Okay, now that's these uh, kind of pixelation you can see, that's the ray tracing that's happening. Um, but if I use the camera that's built into render, Blender and then I render out that frame, we'll get a really, really nice representation of that chair and that, uh, that surface that it's on. 
take a few seconds to calculate and let's open up another viewing window so we can see what's calculated change that to an image viewer okay so there is our chair so one might use these assets in this project for example uh, room to breathe well, there's a expression running at the migration museum a, a year or so ago and a group of us at king's took on the task of recreating this exhibition digitally in an ar environment which is what you can see here and this is the kind of mixed methods approach some of the assets you can see are created in the way that i've just shown you in blender um, some of the assets are created um, through photogrammetry, like the, uh, the little pig that's on the bed here in a moment. There are several environments. There's this classroom uh, environment where there are stories hidden throughout the space. And if you want to see the rest of this video, you can go along to uh, our Vimeo site and just go to vimeo.com kings digital lab slash RTV. So let's look at one more method of 3D creation. Um, this time using an iPad and an application called uh, Nomad Sculpt. So this method we use a kind of the concept of virtual clay and it's quite common when you're using clay to have a, a symmetry turned on when you're manipulating that digital clay. Um, we have lots of different kind of brushes which manipulate the clay in different ways. So here I'm going to try and do some rudimentary blocking out of shapes stretching out um, I'm going to aim to just do a kind of simple face if we move it off to the left I'm going to try to make a bit of a profile or a human profile here um, this is one of the harder ones to demonstrate because it's actually takes it's quite time consuming and secondly I'm not very good at it as you can see that was supposed to be a nose let's get rid of that and let's grab from the middle then go back into profile view and extend that nose a little bit more um, and let's make some kind of eye socket shapes. Uh, I'm not aiming for much here again, it's just a quick demonstration. One of the advantages of having symmetry is I can sort of trace on an ear here. Um, and if I turn around the, uh, well, let's just increase the resolution of the, the mesh a little bit so that we can get some more detail on there. And I will go over those details. Okay, so we've got a much better and more bolder bold line there and um, everything I do on one side is replicated to the other side of the clay but you can see the kind of uh, quadrilateral shapes all over the all over the mesh so this is basically using the same kind of uh, meshes that we were manipulating into chairs just now um, or other complex objects but it's just a very different organic way of, um, uh, of pushing uh, those shapes into this kind of form that we want. As I said, not particularly good at this. Or rather, that's not true. I'm okay at this, but it just takes a long time and a lot of patience to get the kind of uh, shapes that you want. Um, so I'll battle on with this for a little while longer, just so you can get a bit more of the idea. And I'm just switching between different types of... Um, interaction on that virtual clay um, locking in some bigger bolder uh, textures across the clay there let's use a kind of inflating method to bring in those cheekbones and puff out those lips a little bit And you'll find that even if you don't have much artistic talent like myself, um, the very fact that you can keep doing things and undoing things and redoing things means that you can work up to some pretty good results. And it's a very kind of meditative and, uh, and effective process. Um, what I will show you is something that someone has done who knows exactly what they're doing and spent a lot of time creating um, a sculpture of a dinosaur in a moment. Let's just put some eyeballs in here, move them into position. My 
email still coming through at the weekend. Um, so I can get those into a kind of rough position. And then I can duplicate them from one side to the next, to the other side, from uh, right to left, I think. And let's merge all those objects together into one bit of clay. And then I can continue manipulating that new shape. But let's stop there with, with my dreadful model. So as I mentioned, I'm using Nomad Sculpt on an iPad to create this. Um, you could equally be doing this in Blender or ZBrush, or ZBrush as it's, as it's known. Um, but let's see what you can actually achieve with this when you really know what you're doing and you have the time to spend on it. This is a piece of work by an artist called Glenn Southern, incredible artist who has created this on the same iPad application, this Tyrannosaur, which you can see is really detailed, beautifully textured and coloured, just adjusting some light. Let's zoom in and have a look at some of that detail. And you'll recognise these sorts of models from uh, big uh, blockbuster productions. Um, we can even, I think, add some movement in here so I can just tweak the eyes a little bit or uh, I think I can move the jaw as well. Okay, jaw, the teeth aren't attached to the jaw, but um, this model is really made for, for 3D printing. And let's have a look at how we might use the sculpting methods in a research setting. So in late 2019, a selection of Titian paintings came to the National Gallery for the first time in possibly hundreds of years, um, and this happened just before lockdown, and there was the very real possibility that this occasion wouldn't be able to be experienced by the volume of people that had been, that had been hoped. Um, a company called Playlines um, created an AR application to put this particular painting, Diane and Actium, into an AR environment and we created a little bit of content to go into that application um, whereby we modelled this painting, this, this scene, in 3D. And as we watch, we're going to transition into a kind of digital representation of the perspective we see here. So I used the, the sculpting method to create those figures and those animals, and I used the more traditional blocky method to create those ruins. And as we go around the different perspectives of this painting, you can start to see some, some really uh, striking things. Um, as we transition and we go through this arch here, you'll see that that nymph at the, at the back of the painting um, actually seems to have her legs truncated into the, uh, into the dace in the water. The cloth has been, uh, has been sculpted. Um, and this was a a way that we could explore the use of space, the composition from different angles and from the perspectives of all the different characters that are in this in this composition. There's also photogrammetry elements in here and it also shows you how much of this this composition is is simply a stage. Um, as you start to move away from the from the audience viewpoint the whole thing breaks down very quickly and let's transition back toward the original painting going through a few digital interpretations changing the light to be uh, more representative and then finally reintroducing Titian's original composition So this is just a section of a longer video talking about the process. And if you want to see the whole thing, please have, go to vimeo.com, King's Digital Lab, slash Titian. Okay, so we've looked at a few tools, workflows. We had a quick look at how you might want to use some of the outputs of these workflows um, in different ways. And we've looked at scanning in photogrammetry, but we can also create scans through LiDAR and later generation iOS devices have LiDAR built in. The quality isn't as good straight out of the box, 
as you might get from a photogrammetry scan, but it's a very quick way of getting a crude survey of a space. And using the output from those, we can get some good indicative measurements and identify the key features that we might want to use as baseline for more precise modelling. Um, so I went along to a local church, St Bartholomew's, uh, taking along my device. It's a very uh, famous local landmark. Um, and I took some photogrammetry images from outside of the church. And I took some uh, LiDAR scans from inside the church. And I took a few kind of reference photos as well, which I ortho rectified um, so that to sort of cancel out the perspective uh, from ground level. But basically from ground level, I was able to create a, a really good reference point for creating a, a model, which we'll have a look at in Blender now. Methods here is you can, I could take this, uh, this model from um, a kind of, uh, from ground level and ortho rectify it and I get a really good sort of indicative um, representation of the height and scale of this, uh, of the front of this church, St Bartholomew's. And also I took my iOS device inside and used it to just create surface scans of the um, of, of the structure inside, so we can see roughly the shapes of the of the windows and naves, um, and discover that there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine of these um, nine of these sections, which are which are roughly uh, equal in their design. Um, now, through using these as indicative um, guidelines and I also took a little bit of reference images uh, let's just find some of those reference images um, so this is how these things look uh, from inside and I can use those textures and those shapes to uh, uh, as further reference for modeling um, I've got um, some other indications for the side elevation And there are other parts of this model as well. Um, but using these as references, I was able to make a sort of clean version of this section, which you can now see here. I'm just turning that on. Um, the details aren't particularly well visible or easily visible in here. So I've used those same techniques that we use to create the chair and the objects uh, to create this repeating section of wall and the, uh, the tunnel that leads behind it. And through texturing, I was able to create the video which you're about to see. So from that really rough model, we've created a, a textured, clean model, just doing a quick fly through to those upper passageways, up into the rafters of the building, so we can see the supporting structures. Um, we get a really good sense of scale and perspective, and we can look at the shape of this building from positions that really weren't plausible from the ground level. I didn't have access to the upper areas of this building, so some of this is, is slight interpretation. but you get a really good sense of the scale. And we basically just modeled that one arch and that one window and then uh, array copied it nine times and then mirrored it across the middle axis. And we've created that whole internal structure. So thank you for indulging me as we went through a few of those processes. Um, what I really hope to do is just give you a quick overview of some of the things that were possible using this kind of technology. We looked at scanning real items, creating items from our imaginations, either using um, a blocky uh, geometric primitive methods or using the sort of more organic clay sculpted methods. Uh, there are ways of doing things, as I mentioned, in, in VR using those same kind of principles. And really, this uh, video is too short for it to be um, particularly instructive in any, of those, um, in any of those techniques, but it's about introducing those ideas to you, trying to stimulate some questions uh, from you, and hopefully the kind of the, the, 
the meatiest part of this um, of this session will come in the opportunity to uh, ask some questions and for me to give you some feedback about how we might go about getting those models into real-time engines like Unity or Unreal. Um, I'm also happy to answer any other questions about um, about project work um, or your own projects or the kind of ambitions that you might have for this technology. Anyway, thanks for listening.